Now presenting, we have Dr. Michael Sharapa from the History Department presenting Delaware Bay Oyster Ecology Comes of Age, the public role of the environmental historian. Do I just advance? Oh, there we are. Excellent. Thank you, everyone. Hold on to your seatbelt now. Um, I, I, I poached that line from a professor in grad school who, who literally could do a one-minute lecture. Um, I'm Michael Sharapa, and what my objective tonight is is to kind of share to you my, my two worlds as an historian, that I'm both a cultural and American cultural and environmental historian, and I'm also a public historian. And what that means is that I am an historian who strives to take my message beyond the classroom and into the lives of everyday people um, in a variety of venues, in their living rooms, in their community halls. But most typically, of course, it means I just try to be a publicly engaged historian, a term we often call being a public intellectual. For me, the joy is that I actually get, in an almost religious-like sense, I'm an historian in almost a pastoral-like role, working with people, uh, getting history from them, but also sharing my perspectives. And it's exciting because I'm not restricted to the immediate classroom setting. So it's exciting being out in the boats and helping people, in this case, in a region where I work, of the Delaware Bay, helping them work through historical issues that are germane to something that they use, which is the holy bivalve, the oyster, that has been a critical resource in the lives of people on the Delaware estuary for, uh, for centuries, going back to the Native Americans. So I do a lot of real traditional sorts of work. You think about historians and public historians. We do historic preservation. We do museum work. We do um, you know, public programming. And this is a few examples of projects I've worked on. Um, but what happens, typically, when you're in the midst of this sort of work, new issues arise. And of course, doing this work, I was not long ago asked by some folks in the community, and this dovetails with my work, was what led to the rise of scientists being so involved in the Delaware Bay? And I said, that's a good question. Let's talk about that. And of course, it ties with my research. Let's go back now. This takes us, uh, this map here is meant, as you see on the left, is to introduce you to the Delaware Estuary. And in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, New York City was growing, both in terms of its population and its industrial activity. They needed to divert water from the upper Delaware Estuary to the city. Um, this, of course, drew the attention of people down the Delaware Bay because they were savvy enough to know that if you divert water from those upper reaches, the northern reaches of the Delaware River in New York State, you're going to affect the salinity levels further down the bay. And that, of course, is going to affect, again, the bivalve because the bivalve thrives in this very delicate mix of fresh and, and salt water we call brackish water. And also in the Delaware Bay, um, if the salt line starts to move up the bay, it's going to endanger both the oyster planting grounds, which are the areas where the oyster folks would plant their bivalves in April, May, and June, and then harvest those during the R months when oysters were in their marketing phase. It got kicked off during this time period when a biologist from Wisconsin named Thurlow, uh, no, not in this case, Julius Nelson, um, came to be the oyster biologist, the field agent, if you will. He was trained by someone that our Kathy Cook knows, uh, William K. Brooks, um, who was a oyster scientist at Johns Hopkins. Um, he was one of those scientists who, in those days that some of my colleagues might recognize, they were out in the field. They were engaging with the actual resource users. There was dialogue. There was cooperation, um, something that sometimes is sorely missing today. Um, one of the things that, of course, was catapulting all of this energy was the fact that the bive have become so valuable to the economy. And for those folks who study the history of science, Early, you know, you know, modern science, I would say, in the United States was very much driven with practical outcomes in mind, which meant we're going to fund you, but we want to make sure that there's some tangible public dividend to the work that you do. And in this case, of course, legislators both in Washington and the state of New Jersey wanted to make sure that if you're going to do oyster science research, you're, uh-oh, <laughs> um, if you're going to do this research, we want to see a practical outcome. And as you can see, there was a lot of investment. 
So Julius Nelson gave way to his son, who took over the mantle of being the Delaware Bay's leading oyster scientist. And they're all responding to some of these threats now. There is an urgent need now to understand the ecology because there are now other wider ecological threats to the region, i.e. the diversion of water in the upper reaches of the estuary. Um, one of the ways in which this sort of escalating interest in oyster ecology was sort of promoted was through promotional literature and other prescriptive literature that instructed the people who used oysters how to better use the resource, how to dredge more efficiently, not kill the oysters while you were doing it, be more sanitary in your processing of oysters, as you can see from the shucking literature. And they even got to go so far as to create, in this case, a, a book that was meant to indoctrinate young oystermen in the 1920s into being a modern, progressive, scientific oysterman, somebody attuned to both actually harvesting the bivalve, but also being mindful of the scientific you know, benefits, strengths, constraints that were all a part of that enterprise. So in 1930, there was actually a resolution where the state of New York was not allowed to take as money, much of the water, the fresh water from the upper reaches as they would have liked, but that ultimately became negotiable. A, a special master or somebody appointed by the Supreme Court had to come in and basically broker an agreement between the state of New Jersey and the state of New York. The, the amount they wanted to take was curtailed, uh, uh, not to the full sort of delight of the oystermen, but it was a workable compromise. It then arose again in 1950. And the reality is, folks, even to this very day, the issue of water diversion um, is still a major issue on the Delaware estuary. It continues to preoccupy the oystermen and other environmentalists in the region because it has a direct effect on the overall health um, of the estuary, that, that delicate blend of fresh and salt water. And it was that debate and that contested issue that led to the rise of oyster science becoming more entrenched on the Delaware Bay. Thank you, folks. <laughs>